Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Larry Hoffheimer, and I am the chairman and founder of the Macular Regeneration Association. For those of you who have had uh, eye shots, injections for anti VEGF, if you look at my this eye, that was yesterday. So, all that being said, welcome, everybody. Uh, we have a very interesting program today. I'm glad you're all participating. Uh, I, want to, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, uh, Novartis, and Notovision uh, for their support of these educational seminars. Uh, please uh, add, do the, use the question and answer button at the bottom of the page. Don't raise your hand. Uh, and our speaker will answer those questions after his presentation. Uh, there's a survey at the close of, of, of the program uh, that takes only about three minutes to, to complete. Uh, please help us better serve you in the future by answering the survey about our virtual patient programs. Uh, it's our hope and goal to begin the in-person programs uh, the middle of next year. And we hope to see many of you there as well. Uh, I also uh, suggest that you go to our website, which is macularhope.org, and you could, where you can register for additional patient seminars. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah Brown is a distinguished member of the Macular Regeneration Association's Medical Board and is a board certified ophthalmologist with more than 10 years of practice experience in the vitreal retinal as a vitreal retina surgeon. Uh, he founded the Brown Retina Institute in 2010 to establish a medical practice devoted to diagnosing, treating, and researching diseases of the retina. And Dr. Brown also holds an academic appointment as clinical association professor of ophthalmology at the University of Texas. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brown, who's going to talk about the basics of macular regeneration, uh, dry versus wet. So. Dr. Brown, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, there is so much exciting, so many exciting things that are happening in macular degeneration today, whether it's the uh, new treatments, new research. So whether it's the research in the way the disease is, progresses and who gets it and who doesn't, how we treat it, and new treatments that are coming. So this is gonna be a very exciting presentation. Some of you who have heard these presentations before, there may be some overlap and things that you've heard before as far as the basics, but then we'll go into where we're going for the future at the end of the presentation. So I think there'll be a little bit of something for everybody in this. So now we're gonna jump into the presentation. So we're gonna be talking about the difference between dry and wet macular degeneration. You can see this picture in the background that shows these little yellow deposits on this orangey red background. And those little yellow deposits are the sign of this condition, macular degeneration. These little deposits will show up years before you've even noticed any changes in your vision, but your eye doctor can see these and let you know, okay, you are at risk for macular degeneration. And let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So the first thing to talk about is what is the macula? So inside the eye, your retina is like the inner lining of the eye. It's like the inner wallpaper. And the central part of the retina is the macula. So it's the area that deals with your central vision. You can see there's a whole lot more retina all around this area that helps us with our peripheral vision. But for details, walking, seeing faces, we need a good, we need good vision from the macula. 
the very center of the macula where you see that blue circle is the fovea. That's where you really get detail. So things like reading small print, details, threading a needle, that's being done by your fovea. So the fovea is the center of the macula and the macula is the center of the retina. Now, if we wanna zoom in on the retina and we're gonna talk a little bit of all the different parts that make up the retina because it'll be helpful to understand why this disease happens. So what we're doing here is we're taking one little slice of the retina and blowing it up very large. And you can see there are all these different layers. The retina is this first layer here. And this is the part that actually responds to light. So are the, there are these cells that are called rods and cones. And you can see these purple rod looking cells here. And they respond to the light that comes in and hits your retina right in here. This, this, these are the rods and cones. Underneath the, the, the rods and cones, there's this pigmented layer. It has a brownish pigmentation to it, and it's called the RPE cells, or retinal pigmented epithelial cells. Those cells, that, that dark layer underneath the retina, takes care of the seeing cells. So it does all the work for the seeing cells. It gets rid of waste products. It transports in nutrients that are needed. Very, very important part of the retina. Without the RPE cells, the retina on top of it starts to die. And then underneath that, there's a barrier that's called Brooks membrane. That's that kind of yellow streak that's going up and down here. And that's important because it's a separation between some blood vessels that are deeper here. You can see these ropey red blood vessels. Those blood vessels are called the choriocapillaris. And so the, you, it's amazing. The eye gets more blood flow per unit of tissue than any other part of your body. And that's because those receptors need to constantly, they respond to light, they send a signal, then they have to get recharged, get ready to respond again, and that takes energy. And that energy, to produce that energy, you need oxygen. So there's a lot of blood flowing through these choriocapillaris blood vessels. And what, what should happen is oxygen should percolate through here and get into these photoreceptors. But we don't want blood vessels getting up there. We just want the oxygen to percolate through and help those receptors recharge and get ready to capture another photon of light. So when we get to start talking about macular degeneration, First, a good important point to note is most people have dry macular degeneration. You hear about the wet more because it can take your vision very quickly, but it's probably only about one in every seven people have the wet form of macular degeneration. So in the dry form, what happens, and this is what happens in pretty much everyone with macular degeneration. In the early stages, now we've taken that same little cartoon diagram, and you can see this little yellow deposit sitting down here, sitting on top of the blood vessels in that pigmented layer. This, this yellow material is sort of like old protein, old lipids, fat particles, parts of the cell wall, things that are supposed to be getting recycled and taken away, but it's building up. And we look in and we can see those little yellow spots like we saw in that first picture. Now, as more and more of those build up, the little deposits themselves can start to affect your vision. And this is what that looks like when the eye doctor looks into your eye. You can see these little clumps of yellow, some pigment, some of those pigmented cells have migrated up into the retina because they're under stress. You can see that in the left picture. So this is what it looks like when the eye doctor looks in your eye and says, okay, yes, I do see signs of macular degeneration. That's what all these little yellow deposits are. Now, over time, in some people, these deposits will start to cause thinning of the retina. And you can see where all these white arrows are pointing to this egg-shaped oval zone. It's almost like a cookie cutter where the retina is no longer there. And we call that geographic atrophy, just geographic because it kind of looks like the shape of a continent on a geography map or something. So it's called geographic atrophy and atrophy is for the thinning. That's what that term means. So some people who have the dry form do go on to lose vision, but it's very slow, very gradual, and it doesn't happen overnight at all. You can see in the left picture, it's even more noticeable, this kind of cookie cutter area where the retina is just thinned out and you don't have any normal tissue sitting here anymore. So this person's gonna have a blind spot right in their central vision. 
And that blind spot can be just as difficult to deal with as someone who has wet macular degeneration and has a scar in their central vision. So this is the advanced form of dry macular degeneration. Now, if we stick with that theme about talking about dry, so as we were talking, it starts with drusen. That's what those little yellow deposits are. It's a German term and it's called drusen. These drusen can cause some minor, minor visual disturbances. Maybe you may see a little distortion from those little deposits. That's what the drusen can do. But usually people are seeing pretty well when it's just at the stage where there's drusen. When they start to get atrophy, they can start to get little blind spots. They may, those disturbances may become a little more distorting. And as those little blind spots open up and gradually grow to what we just saw in that last picture, then you can have these larger blind spots. And that's the atrophy stage. Now, both people who have just drusen alone or people who have the atrophy stage can get the wet form. So it's not like an automatic sequence that you have to go from this to this to this and then it becomes wet. Some people will present on their first day that it's already in the wet form and they never had any atrophy at all. So you can have just a few drusen and get the wet form or you can have many drusen and get the wet form or you can have the atrophy and get the wet form. So the wet form is something that sort of grows out of the dry form. In our country, more than 15 million people have some form, whether it's dry or wet, of macular degeneration. And about 1.7 million have the advanced stage, where it's the advanced wet or the advanced dry. So now let's talk about the wet form. So what makes it wet? What makes it wet is those blood vessels we saw in that first picture. When those blood vessels start to grow into the retina, we call that choroidal neovascularization. All that means is new blood vessels growing from the choroid. And the choroid is that layer of those blood vessels outside the retina. Because it can be so devastating, it's the lead, leading cause of legal blindness in patients over age 65 in the developed world. And more than 200,000 people every year are diagnosed with wet AMD. So let's see what happens with the wet form. So in the wet form, we're going to start with that diagram here, and we've blown it up even larger to give you more detail. You can see on this picture over to the right. This is showing the same thing over here, but now we're seeing all this layer is the retina. The purple layer are these pigmented cells here. And there's that Brooks membrane, that blocking membrane between the two different things, between the retina and the blood vessels underneath, which are the choroid or the choriocapillaris, which where these blood vessels break down into even a smaller little blood vessels in here that's called the choriocapillaris. Okay, so first step, the drusen. So these drusen start to build up. This material, that yellow material in the retina can be very thin, it can be thick, it can block oxygen. And when it's blocking the oxygen from underneath, the retina sitting on top of it feels like it's not getting enough oxygen through there. But this can go on for years that this yellow material starts to build up. Eventually, if that signal from the retina is strong enough, telling those blood vessels to grow, those blood vessels will start migrating up from the choroid, migrating up through that barrier layer, the Brooks membrane, and now getting into the retina. So these blood vessels are growing into the retina because the retina up here is sending a signal. It's sending a chemical saying, we need more oxygen up here. But the problem is we don't want blood vessels growing into the retina because they leak and bleed. These are not normal blood vessels. So what happens is over time, it starts to spread. And now you can see there's this blue tinted layer, and that's just fluid leaking from these blood vessels. You can see how the retina is ballooning up in an arc over that. So it's going to give the person distortion. Things are going to look wavy and distorted. And then they can actually bleed. So now looking at what it looks like when we look in your eye clinically, Here's an example where someone has a growth of blood vessels in the center and there's blood all around it. So that's pretty much going to take most of their central vision away. As time goes on, the blood might absorb, but it may still leave some scar tissue behind like this. Here's what it looks like after the blood absorbs. You've got scar tissue right in the central retina. And so pretty much their reading vision is gone. So we want to catch people much earlier. We want to catch it when it's just starting to grow through, just starting to leak, not when you've got a big hemorrhage in the retina like this. 
So to summarize that quick basic overview to get everybody on the same page, we have the two forms of macular degeneration, the dry form where there's a little deposits. Those deposits might spread and cause thinning of the retina and give you that atrophy that we saw in the advanced stages. Or we have the wet form. You may develop blood vessels that grow into the retina that can leak and bleed. So we talked about how important this disease is and it's just becoming more and more important because as our population is living longer, more people are being diagnosed with it. In the early stages, what you wanna look for are seeing if you're, if you're looking to see if you have any little disturbances in the vision, like little waves, little distortions. As the distortion progresses, you may actually get little blind spots. So you might be reading a word, you can see the middle letters, but you can't see the ending letters. Or you might see just the beginning of the word and the right half of the word is just blanked out because there's a little thin area of retina right there so that the letters are not falling on healthy retina. One thing I always like to go over with patients in the beginning when they're very nervous and, they've, and they're getting this diagnosis is to tell them that it's very rare for you to lose your vision completely. It can happen, it is extremely rare. And that's because all the retina around the macula and the outer macula is still there. And so people do have peripheral vision. Most people, even in the late stages, they can tell you know, that the door is open if there's a chair across the room, but they not, may not be able to see who's in the chair, may not be able to recognize the person walking through the door, but they do have peripheral vision. This is not a disease that makes you go in the dark, totally blind in that sense, but it, it definitely can affect your central vision. So here are some examples. You can see this distortion of the words on the picture on the left. Parts of the letters are missing. The letters are crooked. We call that distortion metamorphopsia. That's a term that we use when we're, we're describing it medically, but it's just distortion, distortion of the letters. You can see the bus on the right of the picture where the person can see there's a bus there, but if they look right at the title of where the bus is going, they can't see it because there's a blind spot right over that zone. So these are some examples of someone in the early stages of the wet form and what they might see. The major risk factors for macular degeneration, we know that 70% of that risk comes from heredity, the genes you've inherited. And the genes may be, there's multiple genes. You may have inherited some from your mother, some from your father, but you add those together and it may increase the risk high enough that it starts to show up. Age is a factor, so the older you are, the more likely it is to show up. Caucasian, it's higher rate of macular degeneration in the Caucasian race. History of smoking, smoking just accelerates all of this, makes it worse. So you really want to avoid smoking if, if you've been diagnosed with this or even if you have any risk of this. Um, low antioxidant blood levels. There's a lot of research showing that antioxidants help detoxify basically some of the, the dangerous things that are happening in the retina and people with macular degeneration, this material building up and the inflammation. So if you have more antioxidants in the bloodstream, it seems that your risk is lower. Hypertension is a risk. It's hard to say if it's truly a risk of the disease or maybe it's just something that makes the disease worse or maybe it makes it progress faster. We've definitely seen that people who have high blood pressure out of control, their wet macular degeneration will progress faster than if it was under control. Other things which are possible risk factors, having sun exposure at a young age, possibly it's not for sure. There's studies that show both sides of that story. Cardiovascular disease, so if you've had heart attack, stroke. Now, most people who have cardiovascular disease are in the same age range as people who get macular degeneration. So it's not completely clear that that's really a risk factor. It may be also just something that goes along with it at the same time. So our understanding of macular degeneration is really increased through a lot of genetic studies. And you know how I was mentioning that we know that 70% of the risk comes from, mac from heredity. Well, we, we know that there's more than 10 different genes that all give a little bit of risk. And there's a couple in there that actually lower your risk if you inherit a certain form of that gene. And they can basically look at your genetic profile and tell what your risk of progressing. Say someone has um, intermediate macular degeneration and they wanna know what's the chance that I'm gonna get to that more advanced stage. 
Well, they've done very good studies looking at people who were in the vitamin studies, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. And they looked at their genetic profile, and they could tell what rate certain groups of people progressed because they studied them for over 10 years. And through looking at what their gene profile is, you can get a pretty good estimate of what their risk of progression to the late stage is. And this is a test that's done by Arctic Medical Laboratories. So now let's talk about some of the common testing that you'll have at your ophthalmologist's office. So the Amser grid. The Amser grid is just a piece of graph paper that has evenly spaced squares. And what it's doing is it's looking to see if you have any distortions in your field of vision. You can see that middle box that says metamorphopsia. That's that distortion. So you see how the boxes are curved and wavy. That's what we're looking for. If you start to see that on your grid, you definitely want to let your doctor know. You should check your grid at least once a week, more often if you can. But if you make a habit and say every Saturday morning, I'm going to put this on the refrigerator and I'm going to look at it at least once a week, you'll know that you'll get it checked. If you do it every day, even better. But um, you're looking for new distortion. If you have central vision loss, a little blind spot you can see on that right box, that would might happen in someone who has a new hemorrhage, or maybe they've got thinning of the retina that has gotten to that size, or maybe they had wet in the past and it's shrunken back to a spot that's that size. So central scotoma or a central blind spot is another feature of macular degeneration. A fluorescein angiogram is a test that might be done. You can see in that upper left picture, a, uh, a small amount of dye is being injected into a vein in the arm, and then a photographer is taking pictures of the eye to see the blood flow in the eye. So as the blood flows in the eye, you can see this picture on the lower left. You can see all the blood vessels lighting up. You can see the drusen, all those little yellow deposits are lighting up, but you don't really see anything leaking at this point in the angiogram. Now, look at this next picture in this, in this different patient. You can see some of these drusen lighting up here, but you see this one thing here that's very abnormal, this bright block of tissue that's lighting up very bright and it's leaking. So this is a sign that these are abnormal blood vessels. These are not normal. And that's the sign of wet macular degeneration. Here's another example of a little crop of blood vessels that's kind of sprouting up through that Brooks membrane, almost like a, like a cauliflower or broccoli head coming up out of the lower layer, and it lights up. And so these are abnormal blood vessels. Now, if it bleeds, you'll see darkness on that picture. So you can see the, the dark background from this blood, and then you can see the light areas that are highlighted where the abnormal blood vessels are kind of peeking through that blood. So here we have wet macular degeneration with blood surrounding. And in the end stage, after the blood goes away, as we said, you still will be left with a scar because of all that blood that was there and the remaining tissue of those abnormal blood vessels. An OCT is probably the most common test that you'll have at your ophthalmologist's office. And basically, it's a laser light that shined into the eye, very light, low level laser, and it bounces off the retina and all the different layers and the light comes back to the camera. And the camera has a computer that can calculate what the curvature of the retina is and what the different layers of the structure are. So here we see the retina, there's this upper layer and it comes down to the dip. Remember we talked about the fovea. The fovea is the very center of the macula. There's a dip in the center. Then it should come back up gradually and smooth. So that's a normal looking retina. Underneath the retina, remember those RPE cells? They show up as this orange layer here. So the light reflects from them very strongly and it goes back to the camera and the camera says, okay, there's a layer of something very reflective right here. So it paints it orange. And then underneath it is the choroid. These are those little blood vessels that are supposed to allow oxygen get up to, to get up into the retina, but they're supposed to stay down here in the choroid. Okay, so now how does this picture look different from the last one? One thing you can see is here's that RPE layer. It comes across here, it's looking good, looking good. And then it starts to balloon up like this. And then it comes back down. 
So there's something pooching up from underneath to push this RPE layer up into the retina. Then next thing we see that doesn't look normal is you can see there's this dark zone across here. There's some fluid that's leaked out underneath the retina and the retina is arching up in kind of like an arch shape where there's fluid under here. So this is a sign of the wet form of macular degeneration. Here's another example used with, with a different OCT machine. You can see the, the RPE, those retinal cells ballooning up here. The chorate is under here and it's blood vessels are pushing up into here. You can even see little, small little like egg-shaped droplets, little cystic spaces where there's fluid into the retina. So here's another example of what wet AMD might look like on the OCT scan. And someone who's getting treatment, we like to do this test pretty frequently so we can see how are they improving? How is this smoothing out? Is the fluid in the retina going away? Is the fluid under the retina going away? How long can we go until they get their next treatment? Those are the things that are the decisions that we make when we look at the pictures. That's what we're looking for. So in general, as we move into kind of thinking about treatment, for at the most basic level, what everyone should know is that green leafy vegetables, spinach, kale, collard greens, turnip greens, bok choy, the green leafy vegetables have been shown in many studies to lower your risk of progression. So even if you're someone who's inherited that most severe form, having more green leafy vegetables, it will progress more slowly. Having fish once or twice a week will help slow down the progression. Protecting your eyes from UV light. UV light does damage to the retina. It's concentrated in the retina when you're out in bright sunlight because your eye focuses the light onto your retina. And so you want to have a good pair of sunglasses. They don't have to be dark sunglasses. In fact, many people like the amber yellow ones, that, that kind of the quote blue blocker lenses. They're kind of a light amber yellow. They make your contrast better but they also make sure it says on them that they block UV light. If you're buying sunglasses over the counter, if it doesn't say, if they're not a tag that says blocks all UV light, then they don't block UV light. They just look good for you. You want ones that actually block UV light. So, and they can be dark or they can be light yellow, doesn't matter. Um, once you get into the more intermediate severity where we're starting to see larger drusen or many medium-sized drusen, or if someone has atrophy, or one eye has had the wet form, that's when we start talking about the vitamins. So that's what our next talk will be, because I'm sure you've seen those vitamins at the store. So there was a very large study called the Age-Related Eye Disease Study. So that's why you're gonna, you'll see AREDs on the side of the bottle of those vitamins. It's for the Age-Related Eye Disease Study. They studied 10, people for 10 years, over 4,000 people were studied, and they were trying to see, would taking these vitamins help slow down cataracts? Would it help slow down macular degeneration? How did it affect people's vision? And that was what they wanted to find out. So just to tell you right off the top, the cataract study did not prove a benefit. So taking these vitamins does not slow down the formation of cataracts. But they did find some interesting things from the standpoint of macular degeneration. So they were looking to see how quickly do people progress to the advanced form? How likely are they to lose 15 letters of vision? So 15 letters is about three lines on the vision chart. So that's what they're looking for is three lines of vision loss on the vision chart. The AREDS formula was designed to match some of the things that are in green leafy vegetables. That's how they figured, okay, let's try this. We know the vegetables work. How about if we put it in a vitamin? So vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, and zinc. They put all that into a vitamin. They had some people taking just the zinc. They had some people taking just the vitamins and they had some people getting a placebo and they had some people taking the whole thing. And what they found is that it did, it reduced the risk of progression by 25%. So that's, that's a big deal. Just by taking a vitamin one pill twice a day, you can slow that rate by 25%. Now, lutein is another protein that you may hear about. It's what makes squash yellow, marigolds yellow. That yellow protein is actually in the retina and it helps filter out blue light, which is more damaging to the retina. The high intense blue light can cause oxidation or, or products that form in the retina that can cause damage. 
So lutein acts as an antioxidant. The yellow protein in the retina absorbs that blue light to try to reduce the damage to the healthy seeing cells. So we knew that that was something. And then the idea was, well, why don't we try doing a study with lutein and zeaxanthin? That's another one of the proteins that can filter out blue light. You may see that over the counter at the store, zeaxanthin. So, the, and the big reason they wanted to try this is because they knew that beta carotene, which was in the first trial, beta carotene can cause an increased risk of lung cancer if you're a smoker. So ideally, they wanted to have a, a vitamin that didn't have that in there. It might be better to have something that doesn't increase anybody's risk. So AREDS2 was designed. That's the second study. So what they did, they had the antioxidant vitamins, just like before, the vitamin C and the E. They add the zinc like before, but then they added lutein and zeaxanthin instead of the beta carotene. Because we knew that having fish helps, they thought, okay, why don't we have another arm of the study where the people get omega-3 fatty acids? And that's what's thought to be the healthy fatty acids that are in fish. So they did the second study. Once again, they found it decreased the risk of progression by 25%, 10-year-long study. So very, very convincing evidence that the vitamins do help. The omega-3 supplementation, though, didn't alter the progression. So we know that fish helps, but something about fish, either it's that you're eating more fish so you don't eat as many hamburgers, or maybe it's that there really is something else that's in fish that's helping us, but just taking an omega-3 vitamin is not as good as having real fish in your diet. So, so we still want you to have uh, real fish in your diet. So another interesting side benefit of doing these studies is they studied the genetic profile of all the patients who were in the study. And you remember how we talked about there were some patients who got zinc alone, some people who got zinc plus the vitamins, some people who got the full vitamin, and then some people who were getting a placebo. And in all of those four groups, there were people with different genetic profiles and they could actually study these different profiles. And how did these people do? How did the people do that had this particular gene and they were receiving nothing for 10 years? What, how did they do compared to the people who had that specific gene and they were getting the full vitamin for 10 years? So what they found is that for certain genetic subtypes, the vitamins are extremely benefit, beneficial. Like they really help a lot. And there are a few, a small number, maybe 10 to 13%, where actually the zinc might not be helpful, like no, no benefit from the zinc. And, and in some people, it might actually be a negative to be taking zinc. And this is not surprising. You know, what, what we've learned through understanding the genetics is that AMD is very variable. So what you have is not the same as what your neighbor has, is not the same even as what your mother had because you have genes that have been introduced from your father. So your mother's AMD may not be the same as your AMD. And that's a really important point. So I have many patients who will ask, well, you know, how come my neighbor, they get one injection every four months and I'm coming five to six weeks or how come they're getting dry AMD and why, why, why do I have wet AMD? We know that all these things play a part. So think of AMD really as a group of diseases. They look similar and that's why we lump it all together, but they're not all the same. Not only that, some people smoke, some people don't smoke. Some people have higher cholesterol, some people have lower cholesterol. All these things play a part in what makes macular degeneration. So some take home points from that beginning section is that, um, so we've got wet and dry, multiple genes play a role. Everyone's AMD is not the same. Everybody should have the green leafy vegetables and having some fish in their diet fish, particularly the oily fish like salmon, mackerel, um, tuna, those are the best. Um, take the vitamins if you have that intermediate stage of macular degeneration. And then the big thing that changed everything was our, when we understood this, this chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor. And that's what we're going to get into. So we're going to talk about wet AMD and treatment. So remember we talked about how these blood vessels grow up into the retina and they leak and they bleed. Well, we, we need to figure out what that chemical is that's causing those blood vessels. That was the big research idea 
years ago, exactly the first idea, first time someone had the idea was back in the 80s, the 1980s, that there might be a chemical that makes abnormal blood vessels grow. And they were thinking about in terms of cancer, they were thinking that how does this cancer cell keep multiplying, keep multiplying, keep growing and not outgrow its blood supply? Well, the reason is it sends out a signal telling blood vessels to come in. So the cancer is actually feeding itself. It's telling blood vessels, come in, come in, give me more oxygen. Well, they figured if it could figure out what that chemical is, it might affect other things. And that turned out to be absolutely the truth, that there's a chemical that all of our body parts use to signal that it needs more oxygen. And that's called vascular endothelial growth factor. And so if we could stop that, we could stop these blood vessels. In the past, I always like to go through what we used to do in the past because these are questions that patients may, may often will have. In the past, we used to use laser. You know, We'll just burn that spot. So we would use a laser and a laser beam would go down right through that spot and it would stop the blood vessels. But you can see there's also a lot of healthy tissue in the field of that laser. So it would damage the healthy tissue also. So the person would get a permanent blind spot. So the blind spot would be smaller than if we just let it grow on its own and it became that huge hemorrhage that you saw in those other pictures. So it did limit the damage, but it created a permanent blind spot in the person's vision. So it was not an ideal treatment. Um, so then what happened next? I wanna jump forward because we wanna get to the new things. Photodynamic therapy came next. So this was a laser that was much lower energy. So it didn't do as much damage to the tissue around, but it, do, it still does some damage to the tissue around it. And you can see there's a dye being infused into the person's arm right here. So we infuse a dye and then we use a low level laser. And basically what the laser does, it activates the dye. Remember how we saw in that fluorescein angiogram, how the dye really concentrates in the abnormal blood vessels? Well, this dye also concentrates in the abnormal blood vessels. So we would use a laser after letting that dye infuse in, and we, that laser would be given to that spot. And what they found is, yes, it gave less damage to the tissue around it, and it could stop the blood vessels, but it still does some damage. And here's an example of showing it shrinking. Here's an example of someone who's had that treatment. So you can see, pre-treatment on their angiogram, you have this little circle of abnormal blood vessels. And then after the treatment, there's no abnormal blood vessels or no blood flowing through those abnormal blood vessels anymore. But you can see it also did something to the healthy blood vessels around it. So it did help, but it still was not perfect. And this is just a graph. I wanna show you this because just to give you perspective to see how much better our treatments are now compared to what we used to do. So in this graph, this is showing on the left side is letters. So these are letters that the person could see. And there's their start point of where they started from. If they gain letters, they will go upward with time. This is time going across here. But what you see is everybody's going downward. So the people who had no treatment, they went down the most. The people who had that dye treatment, it's called photodynamic therapy or PDT, they lost less vision, but they're still losing vision. So out here two years later, they lost maybe 10 letters. So two lines of vision. So they're still losing. They just didn't lose as much as the people who had no treatment. So that's why we don't usually use laser most of the time. In fact, I had a, a, someone ask me that question just this week is why don't we use laser anymore? They even did a study looking at surgery. Yes, you can do a surgery and make a very small opening in the retina and use instruments to go in and grab those blood vessels and pull them out. The problem is those blood vessels are wound up in those RPE cells. So you end up taking out some of the healthy tissue at the same time. And so the overlying retina really doesn't gain any vision back. So, and so unfortunately, the surgical treatment really didn't help people see better. So then we come back to understanding this chemical, this chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor. So it's a chemical that block, that, that causes the bad blood vessels to grow. Now we have medicines that can actually block that chemical. So they bind that chemical and block it. And let's talk a little bit about that. 
So the way to get that chemical to the body is we give it right to the eye. Why don't we use a pill or why don't we use something that could just, you know, maybe inject it in your belly or give a pill or something like that? Well, the reason is we want this really only to work in the eye. That's our ideal because, you know, there are other things. You know, if you break your leg, if you have a heart attack, you want blood vessels to come in and feed that tissue. And it's the same chemical that tells those blood vessels to grow in and feed that injured heart. So you want that, you don't want to just stop all VEGF. VEGF is a good thing in the right place. We just want to stop it from being excessive in the eye. So that's why we give it right to the eye. So we numb the eye, we use abetadine, something to sterilize the eye to prevent infection. And we inject it in a safe place here, right at the edge of where the before the retina starts and so that we and before the lens of the eye is so in this zone right in between here where it's a safe place that we can inject it and it floats into this fluid and it goes down and it dissolves down to the retina and this is kind of telling the story of how a vastin was was first found and in understanding that a tumor will make blood vessels grow into it. And they found that this medicine called Avastin will block those blood vessels. It's an interesting story that there was a patient who also had wet macular degeneration and they were getting Avastin for their cancer. And the researchers saw that their macular degeneration, the bad blood vessels just melted away. So at the University of Miami, they did the first trial of treating people with Avastin. It wasn't designed for the eye. It was designed to treat cancer. It was designed to be given in a vein in the hand and go throughout your whole body to stop the cancer. But in this case, they were using it directly in the eye and lo and behold, it worked. It, it stopped the abnormal blood vessels. So here's an example of one of those early studies showing, remember how we see that retina and the RPE cells ballooning up here. And then as time went on, you can see it flattening, flattening, flattening. Here we see, what do we see here happening? looks like it's starting to come back again. So the reason we keep giving injections is because unfortunately, when these, once these blood vessels have broken that barrier and gotten into the retina, they almost always will come back if you stop the treatment. So that's why we have to keep treating it is because they do come back. Depending on where you are in the course of it and how aggressive they are, some people can go longer in between their treatments, but we do have to keep treatment or treating it or it starts to come back. So in this case, this person here where it was starting to come back, they received their next treatment and you can see it's starting to flatten out again. So clearly a Vastin worked. It was a miracle. Like this is the first treatment that was ever found that could actually improve someone's vision with macular degeneration. All the things we had before that, they just made it not as bad as it would have been without treatment. Now we have something that's actually making it better. And that's why it was such a revolution. Lucentis came out and that was designed for the eye. That was approved in 2006. And it's a smaller molecule. This is just showing how Avastin is a full antibody, which is that big Y-shaped um, molecule here, where Avastin is just a fragment of it. It's much smaller. I mean, I'm sorry, Lucentis is a much smaller fragment of the, of the antibody. And the goal was they wanted it to be something that would pretty much stay in the eye. They wanted it to be metabolized and just to be a small molecule and not hang around as long. That's how they designed it that way. And so now on these studies, we saw the study before where everybody was losing vision. So any of these curves that go downward mean you're losing vision. So in these studies that were done, you can see the people who had no treatment or they had photodynamic therapy, they were losing vision going downward, but the people who received Lucentis, they were going upward. They're actually gaining letters, 10 letters, five letters in the beginning, then up to 10 letters, uh, out at two years later, they had gained 10 letters by getting an injection. They were pretty much being treated every single month with Lucentis. And this was another study showing the same thing. Then in 2011, ILEA came out. It was designed to bind that chemical, the VEGF, even more tightly with the goal to try to get a longer duration. And what they found is they could find that in many patients, you could give the ILEA less frequently and get the same results as you were getting with the Lucentis. So it's not true for everyone. So I always have to say that when we're talking to groups of people, because there are some people that still need the ILEA every four weeks or else 
their their blood vessels come back. But in general, if uh, if you average out a population, they were able to show that they could get the same vision results treating it every two months as treating with Lucentis every month. And these are those studies. And bottom line, you can basically see on this study all the all the all the arms are going upward. So no matter what you were getting, ILEA, Lucentis, four weeks, eight weeks, everybody's seeing better. So that's the bottom line is the, the newer medicines don't necessarily make you see better, they may last longer. That's what we're trying to do now is get things that will last longer. And I wanna skip that topic because I just wanna get into some of the new things in our last 10 minutes here. One of the issues as what we're talking about is that the challenge is how do we manage this in real life? Like people, it is very hard to get an injection every single month for the rest of your life. Do we treat it continuously and just keep doing that? Do we treat it as needed? Like, do we let it get better? And then when it starts coming back and then restart it again? Well, the only problem with that is sometimes when it comes back, it may come back with bleeding and you may lose vision that it that you can't get back. So in general, we try not to just treat it as needed. Most people treat and then extend the interval between their injections as time goes on. So in the beginning, you might need it every four weeks. That's doing well, it's flattened out, you're stable. Now let's go six weeks. That looks good. Let's go eight weeks for your next one, 10 weeks, kind of extending it out like that and seeing for each person how long they can go. So you're only going a little bit longer each time. So even if it does come back, it'll be just starting to come back. So we know, and we can see that on their OCT scan that, oh, there's fluid coming back now. We better shorten their interval. Maybe let's make it two weeks shorter for next time. Now in that quest to find medicines that last longer, Novartis came up with a medication called Beovu. And it's a smaller molecule. You can get more molecules in every little milliliter of fluid because it's such a small molecule. And what they found is, wow, this was, this was a big step forward. People could go 12 weeks. And here we have about 50% of patients able to go every 12 weeks for their injection and maintain their vision, just as good as someone getting say Lucentis every four weeks. So that was a definite step forward. And here's an example in the, in the actual study that got the approval, it was comparing it to a Flibercept or the other name for ILEA. And you can see once again, all curves are the same. Everybody's gaining vision in the beginning. It's leveling off and maintaining out to 48 weeks. Okay, now the issue is that some people had inflammation and this has been the problem. Once the medicine was released, the rate of people getting inflammation in the eye was about four times as much as people who had ILEA. And there were some people who had severe inflammation like inflammation of the blood vessels, blockages of blood vessels. And that occurred um, in about eight to 10 out of 10,000 injections. So it's a pretty rare thing. It's, it's definitely rare. And it's definitely a medicine that works better. It gets the fluid to stop more quickly. It gets the fluid to stay away and you can go longer, but there's this risk. And that's the challenge that we as retina doctors have been dealing with with this medicine. What we've decided, most retina doctors will use this on the patients who are just having a very difficult time with the current medicines where the, even with getting every four weeks, the fluid won't go away. Or maybe the person is just tired of coming every four weeks and wants to try something new. And we discuss there is this risk and you know we've tried other medicines and the other ones don't seem to be able to extend it longer. So unfortunately we were hoping that this was gonna be sort of adapted by pretty much most patients, but it, it, it's really more the rare uncommon patients that we're using this in just because of that risk of having a severe vision loss from inflammation in the retinal blood vessels. So there's our wet. That's what we're gonna talk for now. We're gonna stop right there for now for wet. Now let's switch over to dry. So this big diagram here is not here for you to memorize or know any of this. But what I want to tell you is introduce you the concept that inflammation in the retina plays a part in macular degeneration. So now we're talking about dry. We're talking about those deposits building up and then progressing over time in the retina thinning. 
the body has a very complicated set of proteins that all work together. You see all these arrows pointing up, down, left, right, all these proteins working together that we use to fight off infection. These things will help identify a bacteria that's in your bloodstream. All these proteins work together, they cause inflammation, and they cause that bacteria to die. But unfortunately, if you make little changes in the genes for these proteins, it can cause this inflammation to be running rampant. And it just kind of goes onward, on, on, and on, and on, and low-level inflammation in the retina. And so many of the, the proteins that you see in this pathway are places where if we could stop the inflammation, we might be able to stop the macular degeneration from progressing. And so once again, now we're talking back to this dry issue on the left picture compared to the wet on the right. The end stage wet is on the right, end stage dry is on the left. We wanna to try to stop that atrophy. So there are many companies looking at different parts of that pathway. And I just wanna give you one so you know I want to give you an idea of how rich and how how much depth there is to all this research. Apelis is working on one, of, one that blocks one of those proteins in that pathway, C3. And they are finding that both in phase two and now the phase three results are showing that they can slow down the rate that this thinning is happening. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. There, these studies are take a little longer because that thinning is slower. So they need to follow these people for at least two years before they will be thinking about submitting it to the FDA for approval. But it is, it, it's an exciting new finding. Like we, for the first time, we're finding a way that may be able to slow down the rate of thinning in the retina. Everyone always asks about stem cells. So ideally, we want to have something to repair that injured area where the, where the retina is all thinned out. And so there are a number of studies going on looking at stem cells, whether we inject them directly into the eye or do we just inject them into the retina and let them settle down and grow together and refill that gap? Or do we put them on a very, very, very hair thin sheet that we layer them out perfectly spaced and then put that sheet of tissue under the retina in surgery and put it under that blind spot and to see if that will help preserve the photoreceptors over the top of them. All of these strategies are being looked at. Bottom line, right now, we don't know. We don't know what the best strategy is yet. We don't know what the actual visual potential is for putting in the stem cells in an area where they've already lost some stem cells, uh, where they've already lost those RPE cells. But this area is being worked on. And this is a diagram of showing the surgery to inject the cells under the retina. In terms of more wet AMD research, very exciting thing just got announced October 22nd, this port delivery system. So, you know, we're talking about just the, the hardship of having to come in for all of these injections. The port delivery system was just approved. And it's a little port that you can see here that gets sewn into the eye. You can see this little gray port here. And this may only have to get filled once or twice a year. And this little body of this, this port is filled with medicine that slowly is released out the bottom, gradually. And so what they were able to find is 78% of people went six months or more without needing it to be refilled. And so this is a surgical procedure. It's not going to be for everybody, but it's definitely a step forward, and, um, and I'm sure it's going to be the right thing for certain patients. So we'll be hearing much more about this as it gets released and gets put into practice. So you'll be hearing about that for sure. Another medicine that's coming out, most hopefully, hopefully coming out, they've had very, very good results from their phase three studies, is called Ferisimab. This medicine is a medicine that blocks two different chemicals. It blocks that VEGF we talked about, but there's another arm of the molecule that can block something else, which is called ANG2. It's another protein that's in the pathway of creating those growth, uh, the, that growth of abnormal blood vessels. So it's basically blocking it in two different places in the pathway. And what they were found is that, what they found about half of the people could be treated once every four months, as early as their first year. 
And that's very rare with the medicines that we have now that we can extend someone out to once every four months and still get good vision results. That's the key. We want to still get those good vision results, but with fewer injections. And then you can see here, approximately three quarters of the patients could be treated three months or longer in their first year. So that will be another step forward. So for some people, surgery is not gonna be the right option. It might be this, this medicine is going up for approval next year. So we'll hear about that in 2022, whether that gets approved. Gene therapy. So not a necessarily a gene to replace those gene changes that we talked about earlier that cause macular degeneration, but how about a gene that will cause you to make the chemical that we want? Let's say that gene could cause your retina to produce its own ilea inside the eye. So the gene has to get into the retina in some way, and gene therapy uses a virus where all the internal working of the virus has been taken away. So it's just the coat of the virus, but that coat knows how to get into cells. And then they put the gene in that creates the medication. It may be a very good long-term strategy. And just mentioning one company, there's many, many that are doing this. I just wanna give you a sense for this. Adverum is one of the companies. They're working on one that creates ILEA inside the eye and Basically, the bottom line of all of these genetic studies is it's looking promising. Some patients still do need little rescue injections along the way, but in general, this medicine just keeps getting made inside the eye after just one injection. So we will definitely be hearing more about this as time goes on. We have a great presentation coming up after mine regarding home monitoring. So I'm not even gonna mention this in the interest of time. She will do an excellent job with that. But I always like to leave people with this message. You know, not everybody is going to have 20-20 vision into their 90s. Some people are going to lose vision. And know that this is something that happens and you may feel depressed about that. Do the things that can help you. Reach out, go to support groups, register for disability, they have great programs in different states that can get you low vision aids. Go to a low vision clinic, ask your doctor about if they are familiar with a low vision clinic. These are ways to help you use the vision that you have to do the best that you can with what you have. So in general, we kind of covered a large area. We talked about wet versus dry. We talked about the imaging devices that help us understand what's happening. We talked about genetics and how everybody's not the same. Macular degeneration is not one question, not just one condition. And we talked about how we can hopefully in the future extend the length of our treatments, extend the time between our treatments, maybe repair the damaged retina with stem cells and growth factors. And I thank you very much for your time. I enjoyed talking with you. Good. So one person had a question about um, cataract surgery in people who have advanced dry macular degeneration. So and there's two levels to that. So one is, would it be helpful? So I would say if, if your doctor is telling you that your cataract is at the stage that it would be helpful, meaning that it's cloudy enough and it's at that stage, yes, you can still get benefit from having cataract surgery because as we said, your peripheral vision is there. You may notice some brightness in colors and things seeming a little more, um, you know, in the areas that you do have vision, it may be a little more vivid so if you're at that stage, I wouldn't fear cataract surgery if, if they're recommending it. Um, uh, you know, that it is a reasonable thing to, to do. Second question is, which you may be wondering is, could the cataract surgery make you have the wet form? And that's been debated and studies show both sides. And bottom line is that if there is a risk, it is very, very, very small. And that's why in some studies it shows there's no risk and in other studies it shows there's some risk. It might be the inflammation that might trigger the wet. When we're talking about risk, we're talking about down in the level of 1% you know, maybe a 1% increase in risk or something like that. Like we're talking a very small risk if there is one, but we have studies that show both sides of that question. Can you have vision loss from diabetes and macular degeneration at the same time? It's not common, but yes, you can. You could have both affecting it. Usually in most cases, one or the other is the more severe condition. But the interesting thing is the medicine that we're talking about, the anti-VEGF works for both. 
So that's the amazing thing. Both of those diseases, diabetes and macular degeneration, the abnormal forms of the advanced forms are triggered or exacerbated by that VEGF. So if we block VEGF, we can make both of those better. So someone said they were getting BioVU injections and now the doctor said he's not gonna use it anymore. Is there a reason? And it's that reason of the inflammation. It is just so hard. It's like rolling a dice. We never know if this is gonna be that one in a thousand person who's going to have a severe inflammation reaction. So some doctors have just decided not to use it. And that's a reasonable decision. I mean, you know, they're looking out for their patients. And um, so, you know, that, that's certainly a reasonable decision that that doctor has made. Someone said they had heard that the drusen and the macula are the same as cholesterol. They're not exactly the same as cholesterol, but there is cholesterol in them. And they're wondering if taking a cholesterol medicine would help this. You know, it's interesting that there have been a few studies that have shown that taking a cholesterol medicine might slow the rate of macular degeneration, but it's not a one-to-one. -one, and it's not like, uh, you know, if you lower your cholesterol by 50%, you're gonna get 50% fewer drusen or something like that. So it's an area that's being researched, but there's much more to drusen than just cholesterol, which is probably why it won't be something that will just stop the disease. So it's, you know, we're on the lookout. There have been these association studies. Possibly it may play a role in the future, but it, it won't totally stop it because there's many more proteins and deposits in the drusen besides just cholesterol. Some people notice, and this is the next question, that their eye becomes red and swollen after the injection. Um, uh, Mr. Hoffheimer was showing how your eye can get very red after an injection, and that's just from the little blood vessels on the surface that kind of ooze a little bit after the injection. Totally fine. The, the redness will go away. Doesn't affect your vision. Just happens to be at that spot, a little blood vessel was oozing. Some people get redness from like a, a reaction to the iodine, or the Q-tips that we put in or whatever is being used to numb the eye. And there are some people who are allergic to the iodine that's in betadine. Betadine is by far the best way to prevent infection. And the last thing we wanna do is give our patients an infection when they get the injection. So we try to use the betadine most of the time, but some people are allergic and there are some things that can be done. And you can ask your doctor and, and ask them, um, you can even do a little test where they put a little drop of it on your skin overnight and see if you get a reaction to it on your skin. Um, so, uh, but in general, what we usually try to tell people to do is use lots of artificial tears on the, on the day that they get their injection. So every hour or two, put the artificial tears, just keep it going. Don't rub your eyes. Usually that helps, but, but yes, some people are more sensitive than others. Then the gene therapy trials, as we said, there does look like there's going to be some role for gene therapy. Some of, the, some of them are been, have been showing that they get more inflammation than others. So this issue of inflammation is going to be a big one going forward with all of these medications. Um, so that's going to be an important thing that may separate some of the gene therapies from others. So we're still in the phase really where we're evaluating these patients, but, but certainly data has been published showing that people can go months, year, with not having another injection um, who have been in the, in the gene therapy trial. So it is looking positive. And then the next question was about the port delivery, which we talked about that. And then do we think there will be a cure in the future? A cure is a hard thing, you know, um, because it's a multifactorial disease, just like we say, you know, some diseases have one thing that cause it. And if you get that one thing, you get the disease. Other things are multifactorial. There's multiple little things that all give you a little bit of risk. So it's hard to say whether we will have a full cure one day, but it does look like we're getting to a point where living with it is going to be easier because you won't have to have as many treatments and we can maintain your vision for longer. That's kind of where we are now, but it, it's hard to say. Hopefully one day there is an actual cure. Um, one patient asks their retinal drusen are the same as optic nerve drusen, and they are definitely different. Optic nerve drusen have a lot of calcium. They're not having the same cause. They're not caused by, by the same, same genes or anything. So they truly are different. 
And then the last question is that someone who has dry AMD and they're wondering, is it for sure that it's going to progress? They can't take ARIDs. Maybe sometimes it bothers their stomach. Um, and so basically a lot of different solutions. So number one, eat healthy, do the green leafy vegetables. That's what does, that's where they got the idea for the ARID study anyway. Um, if you can take, maybe you can take the vitamin C separately. Maybe you can take lutein and zeaxanthin separately. And some people break it up. Maybe it's something that's in the Occuvite tablet itself that bothers that person. So some people will just take all the individual components separately or try to figure out what it is that's actually bothering their stomach and why they can't take it or, you know, so you may be able to get around it in that sense, but eating healthy really is the best thing and wear your sunglasses. So it's been a pleasure talking with you and answering your questions and um, I will turn it over back to Mr. Hoffheimer.